Okay. So this code review will be about uh, an agency production report for agents national title insurance. Uh, as you know, uh, as an insurance company, they have many, many agents, uh, agencies, and uh, they need to monitor how they're doing, how the business is doing. And uh, Steve can definitely talk about it more intelligently than I can. But um, can everyone see the spreadsheet on my screen? Is there anyone that cannot see it? Looks good here. OK. So you can see this graph of all agents' activity uh, going back to September of 2009. And you can see they're tracking uh, three separate metrics in this graph. Entities known as CPLs or closing protection letters, uh, commitment letters or commitments, and policies. So these are key numbers uh, for for the company, and and they keep track of this stuff. Um, currently, and I don't know for how long they've been doing this, but uh, as I heard it, uh, they're manually entering these data into the spreadsheet uh, to generate uh, these graphs. So it's a lot of work, and uh, Steve knew that if we were to put something like this on the website, that they would really, really like it. Um, and so uh, we started to put something together for that. Um, we have a, an issue in Redmine for uh, this TitleNet project, and uh, it has the spreadsheets that are basically the sources of uh, the graphs that we're trying to replicate on the website. Um, this day-to-day -day master is the one that we were looking at just a moment ago. Um, and so as kind of a first step, uh, we thought we would... Go ahead. The, uh, show them the depths of what they did manually every day. That, every day they went into that day-to-day -day chart and they pulled out all those reports every day. For a year, two years, whatever it is, they went in and they ran our reports and they manually assembled all of that data every day and updated all these stupid reports uh, and have been assembling it in this Excel spreadsheet for years and never told me this even existed. Uh, but our, we're using it as a critical piece of their operations to s figure out uh, if they're losing money, gaining money, or whatever. I'm like, just because they didn't want us to spend money on building this report, but over and over and over and over. So, anyway, so when I saw this, I'm like, yeah, we would love this to be in the new system. So, anyway, that was kind of a, I can't, the effort wasn't. Yeah, so, yeah, as Steve said, there's, there's a lot of effort that's gone into uh, what we see here in the spreadsheet, and obviously we can make that, uh, we, can, we can make that effort go away by having this on the website. So uh, as kind of a first step, uh, we thought, well, we'll show the policies, CPLs, and commitment letters, the same three metrics that we see in the Excel spreadsheet uh, over all time. We'll show those data on a monthly basis, uh, filterable optionally by agent and time range. So they can look at a particular agency if they want uh, and a different time range than all time if they wanted to. So um, I guess. Uh, as part of this, uh, Steve realized that a good way to implement this was going to be uh, using this uh, cross-tab function in PostgreSQL. So kind of the, the first thing I want to go over um, is this pivoting in Postgres article by Craig Kirstens. Um, I'll paste the link into our uh, chat here. And so, as you can see, uh, the animation's a little choppy, but this is pretty mind-blowing stuff here. Um, so, what we're talking about in pivoting, um, we'll, we'll just kind of go through the article short, uh, in short order and, and see what's going on here. Um, so, they say this is a, a really basic query. I think it deserves some explanation. Um, but we have this query selecting basically some random data uh, over a period of time of uh, 100 days. Um, so 
they're calling this generate series function to generate the dates and uh, they're calling the random function uh, so that we get some random number uh, for the value and then they have three categories of data OS X, Windows, and Linux. So that's kind of what's going on uh, with this query. Uh, you can see that the results would look uh, basically like what we see in this darker colored table. Uh, we have the date on the left hand side, the uh, type or category of information it is, and then the value uh, for that category for that time. Um, so if we scroll down, we see, okay, there's the OSX stuff, there's the Windows stuff, and there's the Linux stuff. But this isn't really a great way to present the data. It would make more sense if we were showing uh, all categories of data uh, for each date. So that's where the pivoting function comes in. Uh, we need to kind of pivot the data around so that um, each well, we'll just go through it and see see what we're looking at here. Um, so I alluded to the crosstab function in Postgres. Uh, this is contained in a module uh, called table func or table functions. And uh, as you can see, it's really hard to install that. Uh, you just run create extension table func and then you'll have the functions available to you. Um, but what comes next is a little weird. Uh, this uh, crosstab function essentially takes two queries. The first one basically is uh, the data that you're needing. Uh, you're going to select uh, the first column is, is basically what you want uh, for the date uh, in the example we saw before. Uh, the category grouping would be your OS X, Windows, or Linux that we saw before. And then the value is just the, the integer values we were seeing before. So this would basically be the query that uh, you would use to get your data. Uh, the reason it's weird is you see that it's encapsulated in uh, these uh, quotes, the single quotes. So it's, it's just a string um, in the query, but the crosstab function will actually pass that on uh, to the query parser and, and execute it. As a as an actual database query, and then the second query uh, that's passed to the crosstab function is uh, basically a query that gets your category names, your OS X, Windows, and Linux. And then um, if we see, kind of uh, the next query is the query that we had before. Only this time we're using the crosstab function. And uh, here's some more syntax at the end of it that's a little strange. Um, we have the first column and its data type. Uh, and then each of the groups for which we want to see the data are also uh, listed along with the data type of the data we're going to be showing. So when we do this pivot, uh, you can see that now we're looking at a row for each date and then the value for each of the categories. And that's basically what we wanted to do uh, for the uh, agency production report. Um, we have basically the same kind of situation. We want to iterate over the dates and we have three different metrics that we want to look at. So this is very appropriate for this purpose. Any questions so far? In the uh, the code examples they have farther up on the page, one of them has SCT and one has SCT result. Is that an error or is there an actual difference there? I see. So here it says CT result yeah. and here it says CT. Um, oh. Notice, I'm not, notice that you select a space date instead of a dot date. Does that select a date, b description? Is that casting that? What is that? This, that like uh, they omitted the as right. word, so it's an alias. But yeah, um, Brad, to your question, I, I don't know, but my thinking is that 
this is an alias, so uh, maybe it doesn't matter okay. uh, what word you use here. Um, I'm thinking that's that's the deal. I, I don't think this is actually a function call, um, and we'll see uh, in the in the code the, the query that I wrote for our purposes for TitleNet. Uh, I think I use something different altogether. Um, cool. We'll see when we get there, but I think that's what it it's is. It's also a little misleading because they're they're generating their own data. It's kind of also a little misleading with that generate series and stuff. Obviously, the normal thing you're not making up data; you're doing a query. Right, exactly. Yeah, this is a little weird. That's why I thought it deserved some explanation. Uh, normally, you'd be querying data out of tables. Uh, in this case, they were just generating the data randomly uh, over the last hundred days. So that's a little strange, and I think it's strange too to see this. Yeah. I thought it was interesting though that you could do a generate series if you wanted to do it by week and you didn't want to have to do some math to uh, so it helped it create the buckets. So they're doing it for days, 100 days, but if you did it for the past 24 months, you can generate a series based on the months and then put them into those buckets that way. But it mm -hmm. was uh, it was an easier way of of uh, not having to say, oh, okay, well, let me calculate what month these are all in. It just says, oh, well, here's the series, and then it would figure out where it would go for you, kind of a thing. So, but I mean, obviously, the whole point is the cross tab, not that generate series, but it's kind of a nice bonus. Yeah. So, um, I guess I guess the next thing is just to kind of show you from the user interface perspective what the result is, and then we can dive into a code and uh, look at the implementation some. So I'm going to log in as Delta. This is an administrative account for this application. And we'll get to the administrative dashboard, and it's fetching some data. But before you know, that finishes, I'll click the agency production report. This is the actual report. And so, by default, uh, when you first load the page, it shows data over the last 12 months. Uh, you can see uh, the fusion chart, and it has some interesting functionality. Uh, you can hover over the points and see the exact amounts. Um, there's, there's quite a bit to fusion charts. If you haven't looked at it, uh, they're pretty nice. I'm pretty happy with them. Um, so at the top of the, uh, the report, we do have some filters. We could uh, here we're showing all agencies, so this is the business at large, basically, and then we could filter by any of various uh, agencies. And uh, look at just their numbers. So you can see the numbers are quite lower for Boone Central Title Company. But at a glance, the uh, management and agents national title can see how their agents are doing. Are they doing better, doing worse? Uh, by looking at these data over time, uh, they can get an idea of how they're trending. Uh, it's something uh, you really can't get a sense of uh, easily without uh, visualizing a chart. So, look at continental title. Okay. Now, they stopped doing that daily report in April or May uh, for some reason. Uh, so they weren't pulling data out of 1.9. So by the time we went live on July 1, they did not even notice that production had dropped by 66% uh, of those policy jackets. So the green line is where they make money. The uh, CPLs are just a future indicator. So had they, had they seen that those uh, lines were dropping, they would have been more reactive and said, hey, can, you know, what's, what's, what's going on? So when they went out and talked to them, this was out in Kansas, uh, and they gave them a call and they said, hey, uh, 
uh, what's going on? They're like, well, we just have some problems with the new system is after they talked to them after the July launch. They said, well, we're having some problems with the new system. But that doesn't imply why they were dropping off from April, May, and June. Um, and then when they started questioning, they're like, well, actually, we have these other people uh, make it a little easier for us for a button. They, we just click a button, and it does some stuff for us automatically. Uh, right. fills, it fills in the CPL data for them automatically because when you generate a closing protection letter, you basically you're, you're re-entering the data into the policy. Closing protection letter just says, hey, I'm going to make a policy on you in the future. Okay, great. You're protected for some reason. I don't know what the hell it even means. I don't really care. But uh, the fact that, the fact that they had to rekey that into a into the jacket uh, is apparently why they stopped writing on them so much. And so, had they had this report, they would have noticed that, and they're like, mm -hmm. "This is why. This is what's going to save our bacon." And so, um, they need to get the production way back up where it used to be. Um, but that's the perfect example of the use of this thing, and uh, obviously a significant loss in revenue for them. Um, had they, I don't know if they would have been any quicker to notice that. You know, maybe they would have trimmed a month off of that, but. Um, but us adding new features obviously is going to help them uh, uh, with specific agents. So, so going to get a lot of granularity. So, sorry, Darby, but thought that was worth pointing out. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. It, you know, it gives them the ability to at a glance see how things are going and how they're likely to go in the future. And you know, just by looking at the raw data, it's really hard to see that. So, uh, it's very useful. Uh, this is agency production by month over all time. Uh, an interesting thing, uh, at least I think it's interesting, uh, with Fusion Charts is they uh, automatically figured out how to display the uh, x-axis labels here. Uh, you can see that it's not showing consecutive months, it's actually skipping a month there. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice. Um, down below the chart we have uh, just a tabular view of the same data. And uh, we intend to add more metrics to this, uh, basically, these additional data that we see in the Excel spreadsheet. And they want some more filters, too, I think. Well, we won't be doing the right stuff. The agent, the active agents at month end, we'll just be giving them remittance and average lag days. The other, the other stuff is kind of summary information for all of their agencies in the whole, as a whole, which can't be okay. drilled down on this report. So. Okay. So we'll have more of a summary. This is more of an agent-specific report. The other one will be more of an agent's title, kind of in general, uh, report. Uh, and then also there's a nice feature of uh, Fusion Charts that uh, that we'll be adding eventually that you'll be able to click on any one of those numbers and drill down into that month and actually see more details about uh, that specific month instead of uh, instead of all overall time. But but again, it's another one of the niceties of the of the fusion charts thing that you can actually allow for drill down uh, without redoing everything in your system, which is pretty pretty cool. Yeah. And then we had uh, some hot links here in the, the filters for uh, this year, this quarter, and, and this month. Um, okay, so unless there are other questions, I think we could start to take a look at the implementation. So let's jump into the code. I'm going to open up the uh, controller class. It's pretty skeletal, as you can see. Um, the main portion of the code is here in the index action, if you're not familiar with Zen Framework. Um, we're instantiating a UI class um, and displaying it, essentially. So we'll jump into that UI class. This is where most of the, the logic is built. Um, so I think probably, without diving into too many of the implementation details, we'll want to take a look at the query. So let me jump to that. So 
So we have this public method, uh, get agency production report SQL. Uh, we can pass a, an agency ID, a start, and an end. And we build up this SQL um, for the report. As you can see, it's similar to what we saw in the blog article. Um, something to note at this point is that the complexity of this query doesn't lend itself to uh, being represented by Zend DB select. So um, I had to make some changes, uh, some customizations to a table class uh, so that uh, basically the dependency on Zend DB select is alleviated so that we can use straight SQL to get uh, the data we need. Um, so without diving into those details, um, suffice it to say that the Query is complex enough that it's not readily representable uh, within ZenDB Select and ZenDB EXPR uh, expression class. Um, so in this query, uh, we see basically what we saw before. A uh, couple of things to note. Uh, in this case, the data could be null. So I use the coalesce function to make sure that if it is null, that we just put a zero there. Uh, for the numbers of commitment letters, CPLs, and policies. Uh, you'll notice we have essentially three queries to pull each of these data. Uh, they're union together, and a very important part to this query is the very last part of it, the order by statement. Uh, this is saying that we want to order by the first and second columns of uh, the result set, respectively. And this is important to get this cross-tab functionality to work. If you don't include this, it's probably not going to behave the way you want. So uh, if you do find yourself uh, needing to use this, keep that in mind. Um, and then th there's a second query for uh, the categories. In this case, they're relatively static, so uh, we're simply unnesting an array of the category names. You'll notice the uh, double single quote syntax is uh, how, the, how the quote is escaped within the SQL query. And it appears that I was wrong, that uh, I do use the same uh, CT alias there. I'm wondering if I change it, if it'll still work. Oh, I have to change the thing that refers to it, right? So yeah, it appears that's basically an alias and not actually a function call, as it kind of looks like a function call. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, the uh, 135 and 137 there seem odd to me. Uh, is there any way that that could be using the ZenDB basically parameter binding directly instead of doing a string replace, or is that? Yeah, I, I think so. OK. Yeah, it just seems Yeah, I odd. think so. Yeah, it's it's a little odd. Um, this is an initial implementation. It has very rough edges in, in places. Gotcha. Um, and, and that's one of them. Yeah, this should, if possible, and I think it is, this should be parameterized uh, to avoid SQL injections. Um, for what it's worth, I do uh, filter all the data before they get into this function, but uh, still it's uh, unconventional at best. Other questions? OK. Um, I'm not sure what else to show. I could show the uh, custom table class. Uh, I could show the JavaScript that invokes the uh, Fusion chart. Yeah, it might be good to see uh, how Fusion Charts expects to receive the data. Is it reading the HTML table, or is it some kind of okay. JSON format you give it? Yeah, so the form um, has a content block within it that has the 
a chart container. And then uh, Fusion Charts, uh, basically the chart is rendered into that container. So if we look at my custom form class here, uh, you can see we have a protected JSON data member. It's initialized to an empty object. Um, and we have a set JSON data method designed to populate that data and a get inline JavaScript function and that's basically the JavaScript that invokes a custom uh, JavaScript object and we can jump into that um, would it be worth showing how I came about with the JSON data or yeah I think so because yeah okay uh, Sorry. I was going to say that. Yeah, show show that. But the uh, then there's other variables in the uh, front side of the JavaScript is where it's sending it to. Right? Is that what you're just showing? Yeah. So we were querying the database, but we get a bunch of rows back when we query the database with SQL, right? And that's not JSON. So we need to transform those uh, row data into, into JSON. So um, I wrote a protected method here uh, to build the JSON data from the rows. Um, and it goes through a little bit of logic, um, make sure it's sorted properly. Um, there are some required structures for how the JSON data are expected to appear in Fusion Charts. So uh, you'll see kind of some, uh, I guess, decoration of the data, if you will, um, to comply with, with the expected format. Uh, and then um, we inject the data into the structures, and we have some parameters for the chart and some styles. And that's the JSON data. Cool. Okay, and then to go back to the JavaScript, so you can see the JSON data will be injected into the form object in this fashion. And then once it's instantiated, we'll render uh, the form object. So if we jump to that code, uh, you can see it's pretty simple. Uh, the render method is uh, the important part here, and we're instantiating a new Fusion Charts object, um, setting the JSON data upon it, and telling it where to render. And that's it. Should that uh, line 29 be this ID instead of the hard-coded ID there? Yes. Good catch. Wait. Nope. Nope. Uh, actually, that's the ID of the form. Okay. But indeed, this could be parameterized. Cool. Instead of hard coded. So, Darby, if you show it render now, can you? Is there an easy way in? What do you use in your browser? Safari. Firefox. Is there a way in Firefox to tell it to not use Flash? Yeah, I have flash block on here. So if you turn that on, does that degrade itself into JavaScript? Or is that what you're seeing there? Um, no, that's a yeah, flash. that's a splash. I told it to allow flash. Let's see. Oh, man, we got code review in 15 minutes. Yeah. Everybody hurry. Actually, Mark, we have to leave here in a little bit. Uh, doesn't fall back. Yeah, it's fallen back perfectly on on my sandbox and other places. Like I said in Chrome, I've got you know I tell I go into Chrome and I tell it to block that. I'm not using the flash block. I'm just telling Chrome's developer tools to just disable. I just disabled it and then said, "Hey, behave like an iPad." And that it, uh, it might be that flash block says. I have Flash available, so then mm. Fusion Charts isn't falling back. Instead of saying, I don't have Flash, 
you know, those are kind of gotcha. two different things. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So anyway, that's that's what uh, I've got a ticket open with them there, but I don't I don't think it's our implementation. I think it's I mean I think it's our implementation. It's something minor with our implementation, not not with the plugins. But. Gotcha. Because like I said, I've done simpler charts before, and they work perfectly. So right there, you, yeah, you change it. If you change that to JavaScript, then it won't even try Flash. There you go. So. Notice it just didn't do the silly draw a straight line and then angle it. It just did kind of a wipe effect. But you still have the hover and the click concepts. You still get all the data, which is nice, even though it's JavaScript. So, and that works. And again, that works perfectly on the iPad too, where you can actually click on the buttons or click on the dots on the iPad and it will show you the values. So, so really, you lose nothing when you go from Flash down to JavaScript. Why don't we just leave it on JavaScript then? It seems yeah. to be Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. Cool. Great. Darby, push that over to demo when you get a chance, and we'll see okay. if that, and then see if we can, uh, I'll try to test it on the iPad again. And uh, I didn't even think about doing that until just now. Duh. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, Table class is rather simple. Brad, you might be interested in that. Uh, I just created a set records method so I can inject row data into it. Gotcha. Instead of the set table. Yeah. Any other questions? No, it looks great. Yeah, okay. very cool. Thanks, Darby. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye now. Right. All right. Mark, you coming over here?